folks are getting in here okay. I'm also live streaming this to our HIST YouTube page. So if you know folks that didn't register and want to jump on this, you can send them over. Folks are getting in here okay. Sorry about that. Two mics going at once. We'll just give it a second here. Okay, wow, this is great. We got a lot of participants today that are really interested in this talk. So I'm so excited for that. Um, so again, we'll get started. My name's Chelsea. I'm with the Hawaii Invasive Species Council. And as most of you know, it is Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. Uh, we're here in the first week of Hi Sam. That's what we're calling it for short. Um, and we've organized the month by vow. So these are, um, different land boundaries, landscapes that are defined by the various climate, topography, and the flora and fauna and all the interactions that happen in these lands. So we're starting in week one with the Vau Akua. This is those very upper reaches of the summits where a lot of these unique native species reside and just make up these amazing ecosystems. And we're really lucky today to have David Sisko. He's a state biologist with the Department of Land and Natural Resources, Division of Forestry and Wildlife uh, that focuses all his time on the conservation of the native land snails. Um, so David has worked with endangered species for over 15 years and has coordinated the Division of Forestry and Wildlife's Snail Extinction Prevention Program since its founding in 2012. And what I can do is put a link to their website because it's beautiful. <laughs> I was just looking at it and it has just incredible amount of information and photos about these snails that uh, David's going to share with us today. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand it over to David and just real quick logistics. Um, we have a Q&A box for questions. Please just throughout the presentation, add your questions in there. Uh, we have Kylie here. She's with the coordinating group on alien pest species, and she'll be uh, moderating those questions for David to answer. Um, so David, I'll pass it over to you to share your screen and go ahead and get started. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Chelsea, for the introduction. I'm going to see if I can share my screen. OK, can everyone see that? Looks good. OK, um, so I'll be talking to you today about the current situation that we're facing with our, our land snails and, and then highlighting some of the conservation techniques that are being implemented by the state and our, and our partners across islands. And so, oh, oh my gosh, what is happening? Sorry. Um, so, um, sorry, some recording started happening when I played this slide. Um, to begin, most people uh, associate endangered species in Hawaii with birds and um, large charismatic fauna like sea turtles and monk seals. And um, invertebrates uh, represent the vast majority of animal diversity worldwide and on Pacific islands. Uh, this is especially true, particularly in Hawaii. There are uh, nearly uh, 6,500 described species of invertebrates endemic to the Hawaiian Islands, and they account for about 87% of all terrestrial biodiversity. So some factoids for you there. Um, let's see. So um, Hawaii had one of the most remarkable land snail species radiations uh, in the world with over 750 species found nowhere else on Earth. And uh, as you can see, there is great diversity of form and, and color. They are, are really beautiful animals. Um, if you ever get the chance to, to see them in the wild, it's really something to, to come across them. Um, 
Hawaii, uh, Hawaii's snail diversity is comparable to that existing in North America, and Hawaii is one seventeen hundredth the land area of North America. Uh, so just an incredible amount of diversity that's that's packed into these really tiny islands. Um, in Hawaiian custom, snails sing. They were the kani kua mauna, the singing on the mountain, the music on the mountain, uh, the kani almoi, the voice of the night, the, the singing of the night. Um, and due to Polynesian oral tradition uh, of, of passing on one's genealogy and history through voice, uh, Hawaiian land snails are arguably one of the most revered invertebrate groups in the world um, because they are closely tied uh, and associated with hula and chant. So really awesome cultural ties that are really beautiful. Um, Pacific Island land snails are, are uh, including the Hawaiian endemic subfamily um, Acatinellinae have been important in, in the development of uh, scientific theories and uh, the mechanisms that drive evolution. So Charles Darwin knew about our snails. And it, it's, it's hard to describe to people just how abundant land snails were in the landscape prior to the introduction of a lot of um, endangered species, I, I'm sorry, introduced species that are um, causing their decline. So we had snails from coastal strand all the way up to our, our highest summit areas. And um, they're, important, they're important components of healthy forest ecosystems in the Hawaiian Islands. They drive nutrient cycling and uh, they have a role in plant health due to their grazing habits. Uh, so our, our tree snails, which we have quite a radiation of large and really teeny tiny tree snails, they uh, glean algae and fungus that grow on leaf surfaces. And all of, all of these nutrients that they're eating, they're then pooping out and is washing right in back into the dirt and is um, fertilizing the soil. Additionally, we have a whole suite of ground snails that exist only in Hawaii and they eat dead and decaying vegetation, um, similar to what earthworms do. So they, they have a similar role in decomposition, which is also um, putting nutrients back into the forest ecosystem. So un unfortunately, introduced predators are, are driving the mass extinction of our terrestrial snail fauna. Uh, most notably are Jackson's chameleons. These are a relatively recent introduction. Um, they're, they're originally from Kenya, but they were brought here through the pet trade and they're now on all main Hawaiian islands. Uh, rats are, are a problem for um, our plants and birds and invertebrates across the board. And they were introduced here early on, um, but perhaps the most insidious threat comes from uh, Euglandina rosea. This is the rosy wolf snail, some of you may know it by, and it was brought here on purpose in the 1950s by the Territorial Department of Agriculture as a, a biocontrol to, um, to control uh, introduced, other introduced uh, mollusks like the giant African snail, which most people are probably familiar with. Um, they're a huge crop pest, and so there was a lot of effort to try and control them early on when they were first introduced. And um, uh, consequently, Euglandina rosea has, um, has just gone nuts and it exists on, on all main Hawaiian islands and it's up in some of our highest, most remote, remote, most pristine forest reserves and it's just vacuuming up our snail fauna. And of course, climate change is uh, reducing the range of land snails due to shifting weather patterns and drying trends. Uh, uh, this figure here shows the Waianae Mountains of, um, of the western portion of Oahu from Kaena Point in the top down to the Makakilo area in the bottom part of the figure. And um, this is the current range of Akatanella mustelina, a beautiful um, endemic tree snail to Oahu that exists only in the Waianae Mountains. Um, you're seeing its current range, which, it, which occupies uh, most of the Waianae Mountains and its projected range for 2080, which pretty much shrinks up to the the summit of, of Mount Ka'ala. So these are some pretty sobering initial results we're getting for, for modeling effort that's um, being uh, carried out by our partners at the University of Hawaii and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so uh, prior to 2012, there was quite a lot of interest in snails, but uh, the effort was mostly ad hoc. So the, there was conservation happening associated with certain parcels of land and mitigation that certain entities were needing to do and um, others, uh, other aspects were involved research at the University of Hawaii on certain species, but there was no overarching plan or goal and um, a lot of species were falling through the cracks that had no management attention and so um, the state recognized this and in, in 2012 
started the, the snail extinction prevention program. And our main objectives are to, to obviously provide a safety net and prevent the imminent extinction of, of land snails across the islands, no matter uh, what, what land, land boundaries or, or interests exist, and, and to sync up all these uh, ad hoc rare snail conservation objectives and management techniques and across the islands and, and to integrate more the captive rearing efforts that were ongoing since the 1980s with uh, management of wild populations. And so we've really um, tried to build on the previous research and work that's already happened and amplify it and, and sync it up. Uh, I've, I've worked in land, snake, in land snail conservation now for about a third of my life, and the past few years have by far been some of the most distressing and the most urgent of any time in my career. Um, our, our snail populations are really just slipping through our fingers like water. And um, I'm probably going to depress you now with a, a series of stories just to highlight the urgency and, and, and what's at stake here and how fast things are declining. Um, as one example, the uh, I'm going to tell you about a species that our team has worked really, really hard to save. This is Acatonella fulgens. It's a, a beautiful tree snail once common in the mountains surrounding um, Honolulu. And it was used extensively in lei. It was a lower elevation species. If you've ever seen a beautiful kahuli lei, the chances are it, it has um, Acatonella fulgens shells in it. Um, in 2016, during an extreme rain event, there was a landslide that took out the last known population. Um, Sadly, our team was only able to recover six live snails. And um, you're looking at a picture of the last four known adult Acatonella fulgens in the world in 2016. And I think I have a picture here showing the landslide. These, this population was in one little patch of forest. And of course, um, like a, this is a classic example of a stochastic event taking out a, a rare species that has a restricted range. And, it was just the area around this population that slumped down the mountain. It was really unfortunate. In 2015, um, we, we uh, worked with uh, our partners at the University of Hawaii and conducted a genetic study looking at the last two wild Acatonella populations in the Ko'olau Mountains and uh, a captive population that's been maintained um, for over 20 years. Um, the, this, the objective of this was to try and figure out how best to genetically manage the three distinct populations. Um, um, one of the populations was relatively robust. There were, there were likely hundreds of snails. Um, I, I believe we were able to genetically sample 80 of them back in 2015. Um, we, we started our, our captive rearing laboratory at, at the state in, at the end of 2016, early 2017. Um, and in, in 2018, we um, made an attempt to go up and collect some founders for a, to, to bring back to the lab to start a laboratory population. And we spent over 100 person hours surveying and we were only able to locate three wild snails. They, they were just gone. Um, Another example, Acatonella sourbiana. Um, some people who hike a lot in the Ko'olau might recognize this species as they do occur or did occur around um, some trails. Uh, if you had have asked me what was the most abundant snail in the Ko'olau um, back in 2015, I would have told you Acatonella sourbiana. There were multiple populations and they had quite a spread over the northern Ko'olau. And um, here in a, a picture of 2018 is, is our crew removing some of the last known wild individuals before they completely went extinct, bringing them back into the lab. Um, so just a, a really short time frame. They've, they've just, their populations have just tanked. So I told you earlier that we had around 750 species of unique snails in the islands that didn't exist anywhere else in the world. Unfortunately, introduced predators have already eliminated about half of these species, and uh, we are, are preparing for the near total loss of around 100 species in the next 10 to 10 years or so, um, likely much earlier than that for many species. Um, and the, the scale and the rapidity of, of this loss is really staggering, and there's, there's a lot at stake. And um, these numbers and estimates are based on our Bishop Museum partner surveys and, and historical records that are kept at the, the Bishop Museum. Um, now might be a good time if there's any questions. 
I do have a question actually, David. So sure. um, this one is from Monty and he's asking to what extent do native snails coexist with humans in higher elevation residential areas, say upcountry Maui? Um, are they strictly tied to native forests and would they persist in my little native plant garden if I keep the rats and chameleons out? That's a really good question. And historically, there, there's, uh, I, I think snails on Oahu and, and on Maui would have existed in um, upper elevation uh, uh, residential areas. I'm thinking particularly of um, Makakilo area where there were some, some houses way up in the mountains. Um, Tantalus on Oahu, there would have been tree snails all in there, um, per perhaps in people's yards back in the the um, night, mid, um, early 1900s. Um, up country Maui probably was similar. I don't um, know about those species. Um, they are very much tied to native forests. They can persist in, um, in non-native vegetation, but they're, um, nowadays they, they're very much restricted to upper elevation, more remote habitat. So I, I don't know of any, um, any tree snails aside from some micro snails that, that exist in, um, in residential areas. Maybe in volcanoes, there's some succinia species and, um, and some micro snails that might persist in residential areas. But um, I, I do think if you had a, a, a nice native plants <laughs> and you were able to keep um, rats and chameleons and, and snails out that they might persist. But um, I think our objective these days is to um, get them out into, into native areas that's, that are um, remote and protected from, from people as well as from um, predators. Any other questions? I do have one other question. It cool. says uh, from Derek, I've heard about their voice in chants and melee. Can one actually hear the voice of uh, Kahuli snails? I, th this subject fascinates me. I unfortunately have never heard the snails make noise. And um, I've, I've read about and, and heard about quite a different, quite a few different theories as to what that is um, referring to. And, and some of the theories involve um, there being so many snails at one time that when wind would blow in a, in a tree, their shells would clink together much like a wind chime. And so perhaps the, the singing and the music folklore might surround that. Um, perhaps uh, there, another theory early on um, that, that was brought to the, um, to the forefront was that perhaps it's not the snails making noise, but it's other insects like, like tree crickets, which are really loud, and, but they hide. And so you see the snails and the snails, when they're out at night, similar to the tree crickets, the snails are are very visible, and they're you know they're grazing, so they're moving their mouths. So it's maybe like biological ventriloquism. But um, but others say that perhaps they just don't sing for the scientists, and I'll never be able to hear them. So uh, I I don't know what it is, but it's it's really fascinating um, fascinating folklore, and um, and yeah, I'm that's my answer for that. Great, thanks. I think we can continue, David. Thanks. Continue. Okay. So our strategy moving forward is is pretty much man the lifeboats at this point. Um, we're we're using captive rearing and predator proof fencing to secure and stabilize populations. Um, the long game looks towards control and eradication of predators from landscape scale areas. So so larger areas where snails could be put back into. Um, that are that are safe from predators, but the the immediate future, you know, over the next decade, looks looks like um, a extreme focus on on captive rearing and predator proof fencing to just keep these species on Earth and prevent them from going extinct. So that um, in the future, when we have technology that um, that will allow us to control predators or eliminate predators better, that we actually have snails left to put back into native areas. So as I said, we're, we're kind of focusing mostly on, um, on captive rearing and management of wild populations and, and reestablishment of wild populations in protected areas. And, and another way we're really trying to amplify this effort is with um, partnership capacity. So bringing more partners into the fray and supporting our existing partners that already exist to, um, to help them 
in, in this uh, group effort to try and save, save our snails. So some of the tools that we're currently using are uh, stopgap predator control. So um, this is kind of touchy. So when um, this is particularly for rodents, there, there are no controls for euglandina rosea, unfortunately, but we're, we're pretty good at eliminating rats from um, even large habitat areas. And um, unfortunately, this is a tool we can only use for snails when rosy wolf snails are not present in an area because rats also depredate rosy wolf snails. And so if you if you trap rats in an area around a, a snail population, you could be inadvertently releasing pressure on a, a, a worse predator. And so we're real careful about deploying um, this, this kind of a technique for helping snails. But in areas where, where rats are really bad and we don't yet have rosy wolf snails, um, this can be a, a technique for keeping snails around on the landscape and helping populations out by um, keeping rodent numbers down. Um, Predator-proof fencing has become an essential tool in the fight against uh, our land snail extinction. DLNR and partners currently have 11 of these small units across uh, multiple islands now. And uh, unfortunately, we need about 50 of these. Um, the current design was created by our partners at the Army Natural Resources Program. So they have really pushed the envelope on developing um, these structures and the barriers that we use and have to date built the majority of the exclosures that exist on Oahu. Um, so we're really thankful for their efforts and um, we use their fence design and we're building more fences on Maui and Oahu and other areas that um, they don't manage. So um, you can see there's, uh, this is one of the newer fences we have, this photo. And uh, the fences are a solid wall barrier. They've got slippery smooth sides that are made of a plastic material. And they have a, a rolled hood at the top, which prevents rodents and um, chameleons, which have feet that are kind of um, oriented for climbing. And they can't make it over this hood and the slippery sides. Um, however, rosy wolf snails could cry, can crawl right up and over this fence. And so at the bottom of the fences, we have um, a, a little gauntlet to keep them out. And so that includes a 15 degree angled flange or skirt that runs the perimeter of the fence lines. And um, this angle is difficult for the rosy wolf snails to negotiate. And so they get stuck up in there. Um, if they do make it over that, we have uh, a little shelf that sticks out that also skirts the exposure with cut copper wire mesh that prevents the use rosy wolf snails from getting across it. It's kind of pokey and difficult for them to get a purchase on. And if they make it over that, we electrocute them with a series of uh, two electrical circuits. Um, so it's a real low pulsing voltage that's hooked up to some uh, batteries and a, and a solar system. And so it, it keeps, keeps the, the rosy wolf snail out. It's, it's the most effective barrier, but it's the barrier that's uh, most prone to having issues. Um, so it's, we, we put it at the, as a last resort, but the other barriers are relatively effective as well. Um, this is another fence unit, an older design that was made of metal. They're, they're relatively small. Um, however, you can have thousands of snails protected in, in one of these units and, and multiple species. So they're, they're really effective at, um, at protecting our snails. Uh, we have a captive rearing facility now that maintains um, around 40 species from five islands. And um, Unfortunately, most of what we maintain in the facility no longer have wild counterparts. So they are, they are we believe to be extinct in the wild. And uh, out of necessity, this, our, our captive rearing efforts have turned into more of an arc than we had intended this to be. Um, just out of um, desperation, we had to bring more animals in than we intended to. And so um, it's quite the effort and there's quite a large team now devoted to to keeping these snails safe and happy. Um, we, one of our, our problems is that, you know, we, we have around 40 species, but we also have, uh, we have about 60 populations. So some species we have multiple populations of with no wild counterparts that exist, exist solely at, at one single facility. And so this is a, a real bad all eggs in one basket scenario that we're trying to remedy very quickly. Um, so I'd like to highlight a relatively recent partnership that's been really fruitful. The, the Bishop Museum and affiliated researchers uh, there have been rearing rare snails for many years now, over 20 years. Um, 
particularly many unlisted but extremely rare species in the Amastridae family. And the Honolulu Zoo has also joined in this effort and now um, rears some snails in partnership with us. And so um, the, the impetus for this project is that we really need to split vulnerable populations between facilities to increase redundancy so that if, if there's something bad that happens at one facility that you know not all individuals of a population or a species are, are impacted. We have backups in other places. And so this is a much better strategy. And it will also increase our capacity to, to generate individuals for release into the wild. Um, and I'm really happy to report that um, this partnership has gained momentum. And uh, in 2021, we received a $500,000 grant from the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, Competitive State Wildlife Grants Program to increase these captive rearing efforts at the Bishop Museum and the zoo um, and to improve and create exhibits. And so this will be um, one of the first times that, that the public will actually get to see these animals. Uh, the, the, the benefit of, of partnering with one of these two institutions, or I, I should say not just the benefit, but, um, but uh, 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 icing on the cake is that they're public facing institutions. And so people will actually get to see these animals and um, interact with their keepers and the laboratory staff that are taking care of them. So it's um, um, stay tuned on that and keep a watch out in the next um, three years or so as we, we start implementing these efforts at, at the zoo and the Bishop Museum. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, and so as not to completely depress you, uh, it, it isn't all doom and gloom. Doom and gloom. Um, the Bishop Museum, the Honolulu Zoo, and the SEP Lab, uh, with field assistance from the Army Natural Resources Program, I'm, I'm really happy to report released over 7,000 snails into protected areas uh, in 2021 during a pandemic. So um, I'm really proud of, of this effort, and it's, it's a, it just shows what can happen when, when partnerships are created and um, you really work towards a common goal. So it's... Um, it's a huge accomplishment and it's the most snails that have ever been returned to the landscape in, in Hawaii ever. Um, just another, another species I wanted to hi highlight. Um, this is a Mastra Intermedia. It's endemic to, the, to Oahu in the Waianae Mountains. Um, in 2015, our SEP team pulled out the last known wild Mastra Intermedia. So this, this species we believe went extinct in the wild in 2015. Um, Fortunately, the Bishop Museum um, and, and some of their associated researchers have, have been maintaining this species for over 20 years and they, they had a backup population and we had this single individual. And um, with, with our efforts, the, this species is now reared at the zoo, at the Bishop Museum and the SEP lab. And um, to date, we've released over a thousand, um, probably, pretty, probably a lot more than that at this point, um, if you count the several years prior to 2021. Um, and, and so, you know, this, this species went from going extinct in the wild in 2015 to being back on the landscape, um, potentially in the thousands by, um, by 2021. So real good example of, of what can happen with, um, with some par partnership efforts. And I told you about Acatinella fulgens earlier on, um, in 2016, that we were down to six known individuals that were brought into captivity and in kind of an emergency situation. And um, through, through captive rearing at the SEP lab, our dedicated staff have, have brought this and many other species back from the very brink of extinction. And in 2016, Acatinella fulgens, I can confidently say was was days, if not hours, away from going extinct. The, the individuals that were found were mostly found on the ground where they were very um, you know, exposed to predators. And, and now um, next year, we, we might have enough or, or the following year to release back into the wild into to predator-proof fence um, areas in the Honolulu Watershed Forest Reserve area. So, um, so pretty cool efforts that are, that are going on to save these critical species and um, bring them back to life. And um, with that, I, I wanted to make sure I thank all of our um, many partners across the state that, that work with snails and provide funding and land access. And, um, you know, it, it takes a hui to get this done. And we are very, very grateful for, for all of their contributions. And um, in closing, well, we've made, a, you know, significant progress on a lot of fronts, thanks to investment from the state of Hawaii and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And and partners across the state, Hawaii is really facing a crossroads. Over the next decade, hundreds of our native species will be facing extinction and 
we have the tools and the ability to prevent this from happening, but we really have to scale things up if we are going to prevent this uh, massive loss of biodiversity over the next decade. And uh, we have a lot to lose. And this goes not just for snails, but for plants, birds, and, and other invertebrates. So I would encourage you to, to, to stay involved and active and to vote for measures that, um, that uh, are um, pushing the envelope for conservation in the state. Um, anyways, I'll, I'll um, take questions if anyone's got any. Yeah, thank you so much, David. That was sobering, um, but very hopeful at the end and just feel the devotion of, of you and your team um, to work on the snail conservation and bringing back these populations. I mean, it's just an immense amount of work and that those the snail enclosures, I just had images of Thunderdome and Tina Turner, but kind of the opposite of what that actually entails with the electrocution. But just the amount of work is incredible. So we really appreciate you and your team and for sharing all that. Um, I have a quick question. Who took all these wonderful pictures? Um, most of them are mine. A few others might be from our, our team, yeah, our set team. A there few others are from the Bishop Museum, um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to um, Kylie. There are a few questions uh, so she can share those with you. Great. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Okay, so the first one is how vegetation dependent specific are these populations and is it just predators or also a habitat issue? That's a good question. Um, I think early on in snail declines, there, you know, the habitat loss did play a factor, especially in lower elevations as land was transformed, or, you know, urbanization and, um, and agriculture cleared forest areas that certainly displaced many snails. Um, however, recently, the, you know, the habitat loss is not the issue right now. There's, there's lots of suitable habitat that, that is in great condition for snails, but they're just ghost towns. And that is because no matter what you do to protect habitat, if it's predator uh, um, ungulate fencing, these little, um, I was gonna cuss, um, buggers, the introduced rats and introduced euglandina, they can go right through ungulate fences and into pristine habitats. And they very precisely just remove these species from habitats and the habitat still looks great and it looks like it should have snails there. Um, so it, it so the answer to the first question is early on habitat loss did play a role in snail declines, but that that's um, not really an issue anymore um, as the state and partners protect habitat areas. There's there's lots of good habitat left, but the but that habitat has predators, unfortunately. Um, the snails, they, they can survive on on um, non native vegetation. But um, they, they do seem to have preferences. They, they do like uh, leaves that have glabrous leaves, so smooth, shiny surfaces. We think that's likely because they host a nice biofilm for them to eat. Um, so they, they, we do have populations that exist on non-native vegetation in areas. Uh, snails, unlike birds that can, or, or insects that can leave an area, they're, they're they pretty much are forced to stay where, where they are. So as habitat changes or invasive weeds come in, they're stuck using that. And in many instances, they seem to be fine on, on non-native vegetation, but, um, but they, um, they do prefer native vegetation, it seems. Okay, thanks. Um, so the next one is, do you do any habitat restoration efforts around the remaining snail populations? Any invasive species control? Well, you answered a little bit of that. But... Uh, definitely. Um, populations that are persisting, and this goes for our partners as well uh, at the Army Natural Resources Program, um, Pulama Lanai, um, snail populations that are being tracked and watched. If, if there are introduced weeds that are infiltrating the site, those will definitely be controlled. And um, when Euglandina isn't present, uh, rat control is used to, to try and keep the snail populations healthy. Okay, we've got a few more. So is there a database that looks at current populations of snail species? A database. So the Bishop Museum is making, uh, a, I, I think it might be live now, but they have an awesome database that, that shows um, 
general locations for his historical locations across the islands. They're, they're doing this awesome database um, that, that's looking back through the historical record and, and present day. But um, in general, we, we keep the uh, native snail populations kind of top secret because um, people can, can harm the habitat and the snails themselves if they go trying to look for them. And so um, we don't make those data public. Um, un unfortunately, but we hope that one day the snails are so common again that people will, will see them while they're hiking. True. Okay. Uh, so we've got some folks who want to take action. Are there any ways for us to get involved through volunteer efforts or internships, either in a lab or in a field? at the snail jails? <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, so our program, um, particularly the SEP program, has internship opportunities that, that um, are through KUPU, the KUPU program, the um, Conservation Leadership Development Program, and the, the KUPU um, INACOR. So we, we host interns that way. Um, if you are a student, we, um, we have lots of turnover of student hires in the lab as our students graduate. Um, we, we can't keep them on as a student hire anymore. And so we have positions periodically come up over the semesters for student assistantships in the laboratory. And that's hired through, um, you have to be a student at the University of Hawaii to, to qualify for those, um, those positions. But additionally, um, there are um, internship opportunities with uh, the Army Natural Resources Program, with DLNR, with the, the Ko'olau Mountain, with all of the watershed partnerships, I think, participate in the Kupu Program. And, and all of these programs I'm mentioning are helping to, to preserve habitat for, for snails and other animals. And so um, there's lots of internship opportunities um, available. Um, DLNR has a volunteer uh, website. Uh, I think it's been, there, there hasn't been a ton of opportunities through the pandemic, just obviously just for um, COVID issues, but I um, maybe a link to the volunteer uh, website could be put on the um, on the the site. We occasionally have volunteer opportunities to help us pull weeds and monitor snail populations that are in um, predator-proof fences. So if you watch watch the website, those um, those opportunities might be posted periodically. Uh, yeah. Thanks awesome. for asking Thank that. You. Okay, so where are the areas in the state with the most snail diversity and why are there fewer snails on Hawaii Island? Oh yeah, good question. Um, so uh, Maui Nui was really a, a, a diversity hotspot and, and Oahu was a diversity hotspot. Um, the, particularly the older islands um, seem to have more diversity just because they've had the, the length of time for evolution to occur. Um, Hawaii Island doesn't have a lot of, um, a lot of land snail uh, species radiations just simply because it's younger. I think if we fast forward a few million years and didn't have introduced predators that um, that island would probably have lots of species as well. But there are, there are species on Big Island, uh, native snail species and um, in, in a variety of different families. So it's not devoid of native snails. It has lots of native snails, just not quite as diverse as Maui Nui. So the islands that are, I, I forgot to say, Maui Nui is the islands that compose Lanai, Maui, Koholawe, and uh, Moloka'i. So though that was a hotspot and, and Oahu was really a, a snail diversity hotspot. Okay, the next two are gonna be a, a a little bit related. So is there quantitative data that looks at factors affecting native populations? Um, and a little similarly, which has a bigger impact, predation or habitat fragmentation and climate change? Hmm, good question. Yes, um, we have lots of data on, on the role that predators play. And um, I actually just attended a, um, a thesis defense by Philip Kitamura at the University of Hawaii, where he's been conducting climate change modeling, looking at the potential range reductions for, for, the, for all of the extant Acatonella species. Um, and the, the results are pretty sobering, but they do show that there's, there's habitat that might open up for a lot of Oahu species on other islands, higher islands, as, um, as Oahu might dry up in a lot of areas too much for snails. Um, so we have a lot of data that looking at these, um, there, there are publications 
that that talk about these, but um, but yeah, I, I forgot the last part of that question. Oh, you pretty much answered it just, yeah, that it was okay. either predation or climate change. So um, I have one more. Is it possible for snails DNA to be taken and replicated to ar artificially reproduce them? Um, good question. I, I think potentially yes, in the future. Currently, there are no efforts to clone snails or anything like that. However, um, back in 2019, um, we had Acatinella apex fulva, the last known uh, um, Acatinella apex fulva passed away in our laboratory on New Year's Day, nonetheless. Um, but prior to that snail dying, we banked its tissue, some, some living tissue that was, was taken and put in um, a, little, a little vial with some media that, that supplies the tissue with food to keep it alive. And this was overnighted to the San Diego Zoo's frozen zoo. And that tissue now exists in their frozen zoo in a deep freeze. So um, while, while Acatinella apex fulva may have gone extinct with this last individual, its, it's tissue still lives in, in the frozen zoo. And um, we're, we're planning to implement that and take tissue biopsies, living tissue biopsies and preserve more species um, while we still have them and have the opportunity, even though we don't necessarily have techniques to, to bring them back yet. Um, I think likely in the future that will be possible. And so our role currently today is to make sure that there's tissue banked for future generations that have the technology. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we still have some questions coming in. So right, another one, me... can you talk a little bit more about micro snails? I seem to see, I seem to see them anytime I have a bit of soil under the microscope and always wonder if any of them are native. It seems like it must be a really common, it must be really common to have accidental introductions of these species. There are, so, oh gosh, yes, we have an incredible diversity of micro snails um, across 13 different families in the Hawaiian Islands that are just as rare and just as unique as our large, uh, more colorful tree snails. And um, unfortunately, they've largely been ignored, likely because they're so small and difficult to identify the species. Um, our Bishop Museum partners are doing wonderful research, looking at all of these species, identifying them and mapping their ranges. Um, but, but that's all relatively recent work. So there, there, there's an incredible diversity and you likely are, um, if you're taking soil samples in upper elevation habitats, you're, you're like, those are likely native snail shells you're seeing. Um, potentially even in lower elevation, I've, I found micro snail shells in, um, deposits, uh, on, around, um, coastal strand. So, um, the, the shells from native species uh, can persist for long periods of time, even if the animals have disappeared from the areas, depending on the soil chemistry. Um, so there's a pretty good chance they're native snails. There are quite a few introduced micro snails as well that are very easily transported um, in plants that you buy at nurseries. And they're, they're so tiny, a lot of people don't even notice them and they get accidentally brought around um, in a lot of urban areas and agricultural areas. But, um, but we have hundreds of, of endemic micro snail species across 13 different families. Thanks for asking that question. Okay, and one more. Has Hawaii ever considered introducing biogenetics or gene editing to eradicate the most detrimental invasives such as rodents and mosquitoes species from the Hawaiian islands? I, I think those technologies ha are being considered and, and looked at, but I don't, I don't think we have um, the technology quite yet to implement those for something like a rosy wolf snail, but we certainly um, have been discussing the, the potential for, for something like a, a gene drive, but, but that in, in no way is anything that's um, an option for snails right now. That would take many years of development, but I do think in the future as these technologies become realized and, and uh, more common to implement that they, they might be a tool in the more distant time horizon for, for snail species like you, Glendina. Thanks so much, David. That brings us to the end of our webinar. And 
Man, that was a really great discussion. The audience had some, <laughs> I found really challenging questions <laughs> and you had no problem answering them. So it was really exciting um, to have you engage with our audience and for all of you that participated. It was so great to learn more and we're really excited. I put up the full schedule for Hi Sam um, into the chat box. I just wanted to add on to like ways people can participate with invasive species conservation work, biosecurity um, is engaging in the legislative process. And that gives me a plug for Kylie, who's here and been moderating our questions. She's giving a presentation um, Thursday, tomorrow, 2 to 2.30, two to three ways to participate in Hawaii's lawmaking process. And this will be through a conservation lens, but you know, the state legislative session is happening right now. And it really, you know, it makes it so much better to have more people participating in it. So this is a really helpful webinar um, and also plugs for our other talks this week about fence lines and rapid ohia death, um, birds, not mosquitoes on Friday. So check it out. We hope you guys can join more talks. And if not, we are gonna have the recordings posted to our His page and our His YouTube page. So thanks again so much, David. Um, great seeing you and hearing from you. And thanks to everybody that participated and Kylie for helping us out with our questions and answers. Aloha. Thank you. So it's going to very abruptly end, David, and it's going to